Before we had this giant warehouse full of tools, we started in our humble garage in our apartment complex. And I have wasted a lot of money along the way to get from there to here. And I don't want you to make the same mistakes. Hi, I'm Davis and my wife Jenny and I have started three different businesses selling what we make and we've made a little over a half a million dollars. And if you're trying to make your way to your first 10K and beyond, no matter how big or how small your shop is, there are some really important things we wanna consider when we wanna start or grow our business. But please hear me, you do not have to spend a dime. We're gonna show you how we optimize everything in our shop and we're gonna show you how to do it yourself without spending any of your own money. And I'll tell you some of the mistakes that we made so you don't fall into the same traps either. The goal of this video is for you to transform your shop into a safe, clean, reliable, and efficient workspace where you can make some good money. I wanna get you ready for when your customers buy out all of your inventory and then demand that you make more because they're so excited to buy your stuff. If you get excited about the idea of having a ton of orders from your customers, I am so excited for you. I remember the first time we thought about that, I dreamed of all of the furniture that we would have to make. And hopefully you felt that way before too. So today we're gonna take all that excitement, passion, whatever you wanna call it. Today, we are gonna talk about eight ways to get your shop ready to make money woodworking. All right, the first thing we wanna do is we want to clean the shop. If we start trying to build a bunch of stuff because orders are piling up, that's not the time to clean the shop. If we get hurt in the middle of building all that stuff, or if we get our ankles twisted up in a bunch of extension cords that are lying around, we're not gonna be able to make much money. A clean shop is a safe shop, and a safe shop is an efficient shop. So I'm just gonna take you around and show you different ways that we keep our shop clean and safe, and maybe that'll spark a couple ideas for you. So obviously we try to keep the floor pretty clean. I don't like to let sawdust pile up. That gets really slippery and, and just nasty. I try to keep all cords and cables and stuff up against the wall, not out in the middle of the open floor. So I try to route things along the wall as best I can. Oh, another thing I almost missed. We have fire extinguishers everywhere, right next to the lumber pile. There's one right here by the electric panel and there's another one by the door over there. You wanna make sure that they're easy to get to in case of a fire and you don't have to trip over anything in order to get to them. We keep gloves right by the lumber storage so that when we're loading or unloading lumber, the gloves protect our hands from getting mushed, scratched, or splinters, or whatever. We have a first aid kit and trauma kits at just about every workstation for when, not if, something happens, we're prepared to take care of that. We try not to store things on the ground just so they don't get like water damage or anything like that. Um, so everything we try to keep up off the floor at least a little bit and that that helps We also have multiple trash cans I don't really want to reach very far to have to put something in the trash Otherwise my lazy butt is just gonna drop it on the floor or leave it on the table and that's not good But the most important thing probably before we even come into the shop We have a box of safety glasses and earplugs Right by the door to the shop So if anybody comes in or out they have no excuse for not wearing it if the tools are on I used to not care about shop safety very much. I mean, I've got a pretty high risk tolerance personally. I mean, Jenny and I fly through hurricanes with the Air Force, so. But over the years, I've learned that if my business stopped because I got hurt, that's scarier to me than <laughs> riding a motorcycle, bungee jumping, skydiving, you name it. When you run a business, it, your personal safety isn't about you anymore. It's about helping the customer. And if you're hurt, then you can't help very many customers. So keep your shop clean and keep it as safe as you possibly can. The next thing you can do to transform your shop space to help you make more money is to think bigger. What exactly does that mean? Well, if you wanna make your way to your first 10K, you're gonna have to make a lot of stuff. And you probably can't make your garage much bigger. But I promise you, there is always a way to make it happen. We have to use our imagination to figure out what our shop would have to look like if we had to build, say, a hundred cutting boards or five kitchen tables all at once. When we get a whole bunch of orders at one time, like we all wanna have, we need to have a plan of how we're gonna get them all built and delivered on time. And the most practical tip we have for this one is to make everything mobile. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into that drawer where all the extras for your tools live. You're gonna pull out all the casters you can and put the big tools on wheels so that you can move them around when you need to. Keeping your big tools mobile will allow you to build a lot of things all at once and then completely reorganize your shop to be convenient and efficient for the next step of the build. Even if you're not able to put your tools on wheels, sometimes just knowing where you're gonna 
gonna have to stack things or where you're gonna have to put large amounts of lumber is really helpful. You also wanna have a plan for staying organized, that way you can make more money in less time. But here's the crazy part. Even though we're in this 4,200 square foot warehouse, all of our big tools are still on wheels because this lesson was so valuable to us. When we were stationed in North Dakota and I just had a little hobby garage shop, I followed the principle, a lot of us do, of the table saw is the heart of the shop. There's the table saw back there. But when I would go to assemble a lot of pieces of furniture, I didn't have enough room. The dead gum table saw taking up almost half of the shop because it had to be the heart of the workshop or whatever imaginary rule I was following. <laughs> I noticed it because I was editing a YouTube video and I noticed that I was walking around the table saw like 20 times and never turned it on to move things around. And I'm like, why are you fighting with the table saw in the middle of the room? You haven't used it since you broke down your lumber. And that's when I learned that after I break down all my lumber for the project, I usually don't touch the table saw again. So I started pushing it towards the garage door after I was done cutting down all my lumber and boom, I started making things much faster, much easier without tripping over the outfeed table or anything like that. So you're allowed. If it makes sense to you and your shop and your production style, you're allowed to move the big tools around. That's just something we really don't think about as a hobbyist. We're trying to fit as many tools as we can into our garage instead of thinking about moving a lot of product through the garage. So I guess if there's any rule to follow here, it's that when you build something next, think about what would be different if you had to build 10 of them or 100 of them. What would you do differently? And then just think about where you might be able to move your tools. That question was really helpful for us when we were still in our garage before we got this big space. I hope you're happy about the next topic. It's going to be dust collection. Now you don't need a big expensive dust collector like that one. When you're first starting out, literally just a shop vac or even the vacuum from your house, if your roommates will let you, is a great way to keep things clean. If we're gonna do a lot of woodworking, we're gonna be creating a lot of dust. If you have to route a profile on a tabletop and the whole shop is covered with a half inch of man glitter, imagine how much dust there would be if you had to build 10 tables this week. We've really gotta get a hold of the dust. It's much easier to collect dust up front than after you're finished. You want to pull out your toolboxes and see if there's any attachments like this, like this is the one for the router that collects dust. If you're not using them, slap them on and hook up a shop vac to it. Again, it can just be a shop vac or even a household vacuum cleaner is better than nothing. And we can use the money from our projects to snowball into the larger dust collection systems we may need down the line. And I'm sorry, but this is the only tip in the whole list where I'm gonna recommend you spend a little bit of money. I think everybody needs a respirator, or if not a respirator, at least a cheap package of N95 masks. Not only is this dust irritating and annoying, it also can really impact our health. If we don't have a great system to eliminate the dust before it gets into the air, we need to cover our face holes in order to make sure that we're being safe about it. Because a lot of us can be allergic to certain species of wood. For me, red oak, I can't cut red oak or I start sneezing like crazy. I'm allergic to it. A lot of people are. A lot of people get like hives on their forearms and stuff when they work with walnut because the, the sawdust from the table saw causes an allergic reaction. Definitely don't want to be breathing all that in and a mask goes a long way to helping make sure you stay happy and healthy in the shop long term. Trust me, those medical bills will cut into your bottom line. So get rid of dust, or at least block all your face holes from it. I hope these first three ways to prepare your shop to make more money are sparking some ideas for you. I know these were total game changers for us once we started actually making progress in these areas. There's so much value in what we've shared already, and we're not even halfway done. I hope you're thinking about and excited about starting or growing your woodworking business this year. That would be amazing. But thinking about it isn't enough. Indecision is a decision. I don't want you to waste this year just thinking about it. I want you to help people and make money. The time to start a business is now. And unfortunately, watching more content isn't going to help. The algorithms just have us scrolling to the bottom of the page without anybody hearing what we're thinking about. If what would really help you get going is talking to another business owner that understands your situation, you need to do it. And that's why we made the Stud Stack. You can talk to us or other actual business owners about your situation and get encouraging and actually helpful advice to make the business decision that is correct for you. Not a one size fits all video, not a toxic comment section, a human being that has done it before. So join the Stud Stack. It's cheaper than dog food to sign up and to sweeten the deal for the first 10 
10 people that sign up for the stud stack this week, we will send you a signed copy of our favorite sales book. We're pouring our heart and souls into the members of this group. So let's make 2024 the best year our businesses have ever seen. Anyway, the link is below if you want to see more, but enjoy the rest of this free video. All right, so the fourth thing that we want to focus on, this one's going to save your marriage and your wallet. Just like owning a boat, running a business can turn into a money pit that's not as fun as it used to be. If you're committing to start or grow your business this year, I don't want you to spend another dollar on tools or equipment unless your customer is giving you the money to do that. As a recovering tool buying addict, I'm telling you, you do not want to spend your personal money anymore on tools. There are a lot of legal reasons for this too. It's not just personal opinion, but what matters right now is to understand that when you're first starting out, you wanna keep your personal money completely separate from your business money. And that includes tool purchases too. When we first started, I had a bad tool buying addiction. I was trying to rationalize my way to buy any and every tool that I could possibly imagine. And I was using my own personal money from my paycheck in order to buy it. Which is fine if it's a hobby, but if it's a business, you're just sinking more and more money into the pit. After a few months in business and of selling a few things, Jenny sat me down and showed me how much profit we had made in the last couple of months. It was actually a negative number. It was like negative $3,000. I was confused because I knew I was charging enough to make a profit and the business bank account had money in it. So I asked her why it was negative and she showed me the total for all of the tools that I had bought since we started selling things for a profit. She showed me that I bought those tools with personal money but only used the tools for jobs and other clients. And rightly so, they should be tallied with the business money, not with my personal money. And from that moment, I was so embarrassed. It's taken me this long just to tell that story. I was so embarrassed. I was done sinking my own personal money into this business. Th this wasn't a hobby or a, a charity for me anymore. If I wanted a tool, I needed to make sure that the business could pay for it. But I still wanted tools. So what did I do? I started keeping a short list of all the tools that I wanted next. That kept me excited to find and make the next sale. But I didn't buy any of those tools until I had the money from the down payment and a job that required that tool. I raised my prices a little bit to accommodate for this. And that's how I used my unhealthy tool addiction to motivate me to grow my business. I'm gonna show you the couple of tools that I did that with. The first one was this track saw. I wanted a track saw for the longest time. This is the saw I wanted the whole time. It was ridiculously expensive by my standards and I just couldn't justify spending that much. I almost bought a cheaper one on Amazon because that was all I could afford personally. But by being patient, by taking jobs, and by putting the money aside, I was able to buy the one that I wanted without spending any of my own money. It was the business's money. It was the customer's money. I was so happy I waited on the track saw and it made it that much better when I finally bought it and I got to use it. I did the same thing with this planer, with this joiner. This table saw was the last one that I spent with my own money. I did this with the big dust collector that we have. And then most recently, I upgraded our miter saw and the stand it's on so that I can break down lumber faster during the holidays. That's how I bought this giant finishing tent so I don't get finishing spray all over the place. It's how I got all these warehouse racks and everything else. It's how we got two Glowforge lasers to ship our cutting and charcuterie boards. When you start to use money this way, it's unlimited. It's great and I haven't sunk any more of my personal money into these businesses. This new rule transformed the way that I use money in our business and it's made my shop a wonderful place to be and to work and I didn't have to spend any of my own money on it. All right, number five is to inspect all of your jigs or tool attachments. If you're like me, you love adding added functionality to tools. Whether that's a crosscut sled for the table saw, I've seen crazy contraptions for turning a router into a, a knockoff Festool Domino, custom dust collection adapters, you name it, I've seen it all. Whether you're just trying to save money or you're just trying to get more mileage out of a certain tool, jigs can really help you expand what you can do in the shop. But a quick word of warning, jigs by definition allow you to do something with a tool that it was not intentionally designed to do. That doesn't mean it's necessarily unsafe, but we just wanna take a second look at our jigs and ask if they're truly safe. Are they strong and robust enough to handle their task 200 times in a row? Maybe you've got a circle cutting jig for your table saw. 
And while that might be a really cool method to making a round tabletop for your own coffee table, if you had to make 25 coffee tables like that, I don't know that I would wanna use that. I would much rather use the correct tool for the job. A commercially available router circle cutting jig or even a CNC would be an amazing way to do that repeatedly. Not only is it gonna save you time, but it's also going to save you a lot of heartache and God forbid an injury if you were to use a jig that failed on you. For me in my shop personally, I don't like using handmade jigs. I know other production shops do it. I know that we still use one or two like handmade jigs here in the shop, but I don't like them because they smell like an impending lawsuit to me from a future employee. We recently retired the homemade crosscut sled from our table saw with a commercially available crosscut fence. Not only does it do the job a little bit better, it also allowed me to put the dust collection arm back over the table saw blade, so dust collection got better too. Things just go smoothly when you use the right tool for the job and you use attachments that are made specifically for the tool. Anyway, it's your shop, you do what you want. I would just recommend you take a second look at your jigs and see if maybe using the most correct tool for the job would be better for your business long-term. Tip number six is to use clocks and timers to keep yourself on track. When we run a business, the customer is literally paying for our time. And it's fair to them to get what they're paying for, so we wanna make sure that we're not getting distracted. But it also needs to be fair to us that we are allotting and getting paid for the correct time that it took to build their products. Because the time we spend in the shop is time that we're not spending with family or at our other job or volunteering at church or whatever other things you're passionate about outside of the shop. Even if you enjoy your work out in the shop, that's not a form of payment. So we need to be disciplined with how we're spending our time. Back when we were working out of our garage in North Dakota, we started to notice that we would get a little distracted and we'd get sidetracked. And before we knew it, we were adding like two extra hours onto a job that we didn't need to. So what we thought to do was to pull the alarm clock out of our spare bedroom that we weren't really using and put it in the shop so that we could start tracking and setting timers for ourselves on certain builds. Just having a clock in the shop made a huge difference and kept us accountable to how much time we were spending on each project. And along that same line of saving time, your customer would not be happy to learn that two of the labor hours they paid for were you trying to find your tape measure or your pencil. We also keep multiples of things all over the shop. I used to work 36 hour shifts out in the missile fields when we were stationed in North Dakota and I had a very limited amount of time to build stuff before I had to go back into work. Every second I spent looking for the tape measure that I forgot where I set it down or trying to find the pencil that was sitting in my ear the whole time just lost me so much time. I missed a deadline once. It was for a coffee table for a friend and it was the first time and last time since that I've missed a deadline. I vowed to never miss a deadline ever again. No excuses, it was all up to me. So now, everywhere you look around the shop, I've got a tape measure, I've got some sort of pencil or writing instrument within a step and arm's reach at all times. I have extra squares and rulers. I have drills and impact drivers. I have first aid kits, we talked about those already. I've got another drill over here. I've got another set of drill and impact drivers over there. I even have duplicate sets of drill bits and driver bits. I have a package of these cheap screwdrivers on like every work table so that I'm never without a screwdriver. I have gloves all over the place. You saw the ones over by the lumber rack, but I've got some here too. Towels also. I know you've got more than one tape measure and more than one pencil in your house. Just put them around the shop in the most commonly used areas. If you lose your tape measure, don't waste time looking for it. Just grab the spare one. A cheap box of mechanical pencils. You can throw one in every corner of the shop and two in your pockets and you'll never be without a pencil. You do all that, you're gonna be shocked at the amount of time you save and you're gonna be able to stay focused on whatever your project is without getting distracted. Because if I start looking for a tape measure, I start getting mad that the workshop is cluttered. So I start cleaning and before you know it, I spent two hours cleaning instead of finishing the project I was working on. I don't know if you wanna call that ADD or whatever, but I really struggle to stay on task and having multiples of everything around the shop really helps me do that. Maybe that can help you too. And for the last tip, I wanna share with you something from one of the members of the Stud Stack. One of our business owners in there has a business that makes thousands of dollars and they don't have a shop. They don't have a shop. They have a carport and they have a membership to a makerspace. They build custom furniture 
and they don't even have a shop and they make thousands of dollars every year. See, you can do all the shop improvements you want. You can rent a 4,000 square foot warehouse, fill it full of tools. You can pipe dust collection through the walls and coming out everywhere if you want, but that's not gonna help you make money. At the end of the day, you can make money without a shop, anything is possible. Don't get tricked by all the tool companies into buying a ton of things and, and waiting until your shop is perfect to start your business because that's just sinking more of your personal money into what's not even a business yet. We get a lot of DMs from people on Instagram asking how they can prepare their shop to start and I always say, just start, just start. You'll figure out what you need along the way. Your shop, no matter its condition, is already ready to make some money. We just need to use what we already have to snowball our wins into bigger and bigger profits. Otherwise, your dream shop will always be your dream shop and not your real shop. Take action, make some money, and start before you're ready. So I hope this helped. Go clean your shop and join the Stud Stack too if you're serious about growing your business this year. Yeah,